Labor is celebrating a huge win in its promise to reform industrial relations, securing parliamentary support for laws that change the gig economy, casual work and labour hire. Labor secured green support by adopting one of the Greens' ideas, the right for workers to ignore their bosses. In a moment, what it means for business, bosses and all of our lives after the workday is done. Maybe I should DM Gregory. I just got off the phone with Matthew. No, don't do anything. It's illegal to work on weekend in France. Okay, well, now you're just being dramatic. That's Lily Collins in the Netflix smash Emily in Paris, bringing an alarmingly American sensibility to her exciting new marketing job in France. Emily is ambitious and obsessive, and she actually wants to work nights and weekends, shocking her French colleague, Julien. Julien might not put it like this, but he's talking about the right to disconnect. That is, when you see your boss calling or hear the ping of an email while you're trying to cook dinner and just ignore it. Employers and employees might have pretty different views as to whether or not this is reasonable. And that's the crux of some big changes presently sweeping through federal parliament. It's a battle between unions and the Labor government on one side and big employers on the other. Should staff have the right to shut off email and put the phone on do not disturb out of hours? Dennis Shanahan is The Australian's national editor. Dennis, I think last time we spoke to you on the front, we might have called you while you were on your holidays at the South Coast. I feel like we might have broken the law accidentally there. Well, yes, the disconnect. I should have the right to be able to say, no, you can't call me. But strangely enough, journalism seems to involve a lot of broken holidays, and a lot of calls from Claire Harvey. It's one of the subtleties of workplaces, though, isn't it? Because sometimes the person calling you when you're on holidays or on a day off or late at night is not necessarily the big bad boss, but it's a colleague who's in a jam who just needs some help. Precisely, and particularly in industries like ours, and there are a whole lot of others. Often it's not just the employer saying, right, you must do this, but it's a colleague who's saying, oh, look, I'm really stuck. And so I think this is one of the difficulties that the employers saw with the disconnect laws and this idea, the compromise that business accepted and which the independents worked for to try and say, right, you will be able to do it, but there won't be any penalties involved either way. And so I think that's a sensible way to actually come to what was a sticking point for the independents and of grave concern for the employers. Workplace Relations Minister Tony Burke has just scored a huge win, securing parliamentary support for his package of industrial relations reforms. But what's actually happened is that Tony Burke has realised how to play the political game of the Senate. Now, he's done it in a much better way than Scott Morrison and his government ever did. What Tony Burke and Anthony Albanese have done is use their long-term parliamentary experience to treat independents and Greens, senators particularly, but also in the lower house, to draw them in, talk to them and negotiate. And remember, we were expecting that this year was going to be a year of Senate blockade and it was going to be a very difficult year for Labor. But in the end, I think Labor has succeeded where the Morrison government failed because there was more parliamentary experience involved in the negotiations. Anthony Albanese came to power in May 2022, promising to reform Australia's industrial landscape, in particular to protect workers in the gig economy and other sectors they said were being exploited. This is a sacred topic for the Labor Party, Labor was founded in the union movement and the big unions are still immensely powerful within the party. The first half of the industrial relations changes happened in late 2022. That's when the government introduced some controversial changes, like enabling multi-enterprise bargaining, 
That's where different employees working for different companies can choose to negotiate with their bosses together. Let's say there were dozens of bakeries across Brisbane and all the bakers agreed they wanted certain conditions and pay. Well, the 2022 laws made it possible for their unions to negotiate together with the bosses. The big employer groups didn't like it, saying, among other things, it could be unfair for small businesses that would suddenly find themselves negotiating not with their own employees, but with lawyers employed by a powerful union. One of the goals of those 2022 laws was, as the PM kept saying during the election campaign, to get wages moving. So far, it hasn't worked. Cost of living is going up twice as fast as wages, and the Prime Minister is warning Australians will have to wait another 18 months before they'll see any real pay increase. So now, Tony Burke is back before Parliament with another law he says will close loopholes in the system. If we want workers to be paid properly, we need to close the loopholes. The loopholes, according to the government, include when employers use gig arrangements like food delivery drivers or truckies who are paid as contractors. Casual workers are another so-called loophole, and so is labour hire, where an employer uses another company to bring in staff for a short-term project like construction or roadworks. The unions say those arrangements are all a tricky way for employers to avoid hiring permanent staff with all the entitlements like holidays and sick leave. The employers say gig arrangements are good for workers, that they allow them more flexibility, or in the case of casuals, to earn huge penalty loadings if they choose to work on Sundays or public holidays. The government's big changes go like this. Same job, same pay for labour hire workers. So if you're brought in to spend three weeks digging foundations on a building site, you get paid the same amount as a permanent employee doing the same work. Another change is a clear definition of a casual job. So a boss can't say the person they have working 40 hour weeks is a casual. And minimum conditions for long haul drivers and people effectively working as employees in the gig economy, like DoorDash or Uber Eats. When Labor was first elected, there were many in the business community who were extremely nervous about the reforms that were coming down the pipeline, reforms to the gig economy, for example, which are also part of this package. Looking at the package now as it's going through the Senate, what's your view about how Labor's found a balance between what the union movement wants and what business is worried about? I think business will continue to be worried. What we've seen over the course of the Albanese government is that initially business was quite compliant. They were even complacent. They may have been a bit nervous about a Labor government coming in, and they went quite quiet in the first half of the term. And then they started to realise that after Labor got its first tranche of industrial relations and pay conditions through, that thing that they were just going to keep going. And they were going to get more and more radical more and more demanding and giving more power to the unions and the ACTU. And so what we have seen in the last six to eight months, a hardening of the position from business, from the employer groups and employers overall, understanding that they didn't fight hard enough at the beginning and now they've been played off against a break. Well, yes, they decided in these current legislative changes that they would negotiate They did get some concessions, but I think in the end, business was too accepting of the assurances from the Labor government, and now they've paid a price. They know that now. They can see that, and I think there'll be a different attitude from business going into the next election. But in the meantime, Labor's still dealing with a Greens and Teals-dominated Senate. Coming up after the break, how the government got everyone on board with its IR vision. The Australian subscribers are always the first to know. Join us at theaustralian.com.au. We'll be back in a moment. In the House of Representatives, where the main action of government happens, Anthony Albanese has a one-seat majority. That means he doesn't have to negotiate with anyone to get things done. Labor has enough votes to pass the government's legislation. In the Senate, it's a different story. Bills can't become law until they're also passed by the Senate, 
And that's where the government has to negotiate. To get their laws passed, they need the Greens' 11 votes plus two more. The crucial independents are former rugby player David Pocock, he's a so-called teal independent, and the Jackie Lambie Network's two senators, plus Lydia Thorpe, who used to be in the Greens and is now an independent. In this case, the two crucial votes came from David Pocock and Lydia Thorpe. The Greens came up with that right to disconnect idea, but they wanted an outright ban on bosses contacting workers out of hours. The Senate crossbenchers negotiated that down. So instead, workers get a right not to monitor or respond to unreasonable contact out of work hours if they're not being paid to do so. David Pocock said the crossbench also won two big concessions from Labor. The gig platforms like Uber get what he described as a fairer way of testing who's a genuine employee and who's a genuine contractor. Pocock also won a deal on casuals, So now, if you want to remain a casual, you can, and if you want to convert to permanent, the boss has a right to refuse on fair and reasonable grounds. The risk politically for Labor, though, is that those parties claim credit for Labor's achievements. So the Greens at the next election say these are our IR laws. That's a gamble, isn't it, for Tony Burke? Oh, it is. There's no doubt about that. This will help the Greens. They can say, well, we've done this. We've got a better outcome, as will David Pocock and Jackie Lambie, of course, who's up for re-election. She'll be saying this is all part of hers. But this is the part of the problem of having a hostile Senate and having to deal with the Senate. And so the Greens are already trying to get what they can out of the tax negotiations as they have with the workplace. It does give the Greens an advantage electorally. But the bottom line is it still has given Labor its industrial relations agenda in full. Dennis Shanahan is The Australian's national editor. Harry Trigoboff is the developer who's never shy to speak his mind and he says he's giving up on Sydney. You can check out that story right now, plus all the nation's best news at theaustralian.com.au.